Uh, ladies and gentlemen, a good morning to you all. You are most welcome. Thank you for sparing time to join us in this very important process, not only for Macquarie University, but also very important for the School of Law, important for the Network of Public Interest Lawyers, important for Uganda. A good morning to us. Thank you for coming through. Those of us who are attending in person, we have a few people attending in person, especially those that are going to be physically involved in the deliberations of the day. Those who are coming in online, we still appreciate your presence. Let us know, where are you tuning in from? Where did you log in from? Let us know, it is good to know. Let's use the chat room. Uh, once, once in a while, I'll come up and share who is on and uh, tuning in from wherever we are. Uh, without much ado, I know we've lost 20 minutes, so allow me to invite in the anthems. We'll begin with the anthems. I don't know whether there is a possibility of us to raise to our feet virtually, but those that are in the house, I'm sure we can. Um, admin? Thank <laughs> you. 
Thank you so much. You may resume your seats or resume your gadgets uh, from wherever you are. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, a good morning. You are most welcome to Macquarie University, either physically or virtually. It is a delight and a pleasure to have you. Um, yes, I can see Diana Ahumuza. You're most welcome. I'm a Patricia live. Bragaya Martha, thank you for coming through. Daphne Achen, you recognize your presence. Gloria Nagami, thank you for being here with us. Grace Mark to Suvira, it is a pleasure. Hassan, thank you for making time. Immaculate Omogisha, we can see you. Jolie Chivalama, it is great to have you. Joseph Biomuhanji, yes, you're tuned in. Kange Veronica, great to see you here. Kasacha Mutwalib, great to see you here. Kasama Emmanuel, can see you. Nabilio Emily, and Dr. Najita Musoke, thank you for coming through. Olivia Grace at last net, thank you for coming through. We can see the public relations. Chus, thank you for coming through. Uh, Dr. Ruhueza of the School of Law. Sandra Oriama of the Public Interest Law Clinic, we can see you. Dr. Suvia Nambiru Mokasa, CEO, last net, we can see you. Thank you for coming through. William Okabo Achol, thank you for coming through. Friends, I'm a kind request. Could we use the chat room to indicate our participation here? It is 
It is a good record for the organizers and strictly for the organizers. So let's know who you are, which organization, entity, institution, or law firm. Just those due details will do us good. Uh, I can see William Okabo. He says he's tuning in all the way from Leader City. He, um, he works with Corruption Breaks Crusade. William, thank you for joining us. I can see Kasacha Mutualib Salongo. He's a junior human rights defender from Mayuge. Thank you for joining us. Joseph Biomohanji from the Uganda Consortium on Corporate Accountability, a partner with Netpill. Thank you for coming through. We are glad to have you. We see Gloria Nagami uh, from Moema and Company Advocates and a member of the Network of Public Interest Lawyers. Friends, it is a pleasure to have you. Why are we here? Chapter four of the Constitution of Uganda is one of the celebrated Bill of Rights world over. For a constitution that has been in operation for over 25 years, progress is expected when it comes to the realization of the aspirations of the citizens of Uganda as espoused in the constitution. The aspirations of the people of Uganda are stated in certain terms and strong breath. If you go to the preamble, this is what it says. We, the people of Uganda, recognizing our struggles against forces of tyranny, oppression, and exploitation, committed to building a better future by establishing a socioeconomic and political order through a popular and durable national constitution based on the principles of unity, peace, equality, democracy, freedom, social justice, and progress, end quote. Ladies and gentlemen, the constitution has availed guarantees and has even gone further to make provisions for the enactment of laws and establishment of uh, institutions that are mandated to protect the constitutional rights and ensure the freedoms of all citizens equally. The monitoring, documentation and reporting under the three studies that are to be launched today provides an appraisal of how the laws, processes under the laws, and the institutions mandated to operationalize these laws have gone about respect, protection, and fulfillment of the rights of Ugandans and the freedoms of the citizens as guaranteed under the constitution. The reports are expected to provide first a starting point for truth telling, then a starting point for accountability, but most important, an effective remedy for any abuse and violations of the constitutional guarantees. It is expected that honest and candid conversations will be preempted by these reports to aid a betterment of the implementation of laws made under the constitution for a better democracy. We are here today, ladies and gentlemen, to launch three works. Works of law students at the School of Law. The first is the state of freedom of expression, association and assembly in Uganda in light of the Public Order Management Act 2013. And this was a report that was published in November, 2020. We'll also be launching freedom of expression, assembly and association, a pursuit for democracy in the 2021 elections in Uganda. This is the publication of June 2021. Those two publications or works are products of the LLB fourth year law students at Macquarie University. And so we have an opportunity to dig into the minds of these young scholars. What do they think about their country? And then the third is uh, the 2021 general elections, elections in courts in Uganda, human rights violations and the spectacle of violence. This is a June 2021 publication and it is a product of a team led by a postgraduate student of the of, of Uripec at the School of Law Macquarie University. I will not 
take more of your time. Allow me at this juncture to invite the principal, School of Law, who is also the coordinator of the Public Interest Law Clinic and sits on the advisory committee of the Network of Public Interest Lawyers to welcome us officially in his capacity as the principal and the host. Professor Christopher Mbazira. Uh, thank you so much, Asa. Uh, good morning, colleagues, ladies and, and gentlemen. Uh, once again, uh, welcome to the School of Law, Makerere, virtually as well as uh, physically. Uh, it is refreshing to see so many of you on the line. It's also refreshing to see many of you attending the function physically. I think uh, the COVID-19 uh, lockdowns and uh, what has come out of it has taught us so many things. It has actually taught us one very big lesson that we, are, we can actually enjoy our freedoms of expression virtually. We can be in the same virtual room, uh, even when we are physically away from each other. We can also do so many things on, online. Uh, this project that uh, resulted into the report that we are going to uh, listen to today is a very important project in the School of Law. Why? Because we see that the freedom of expression is under attack. So many actors, so many organizations are working on different things in the areas of governance, in the areas of human rights, access to justice, social justice, and, and the like. But it is turning out that actually without a freedom of expression, we cannot enjoy various rights that we are advocating for. The School of Law here at Makere Lea protects the freedom of expression and related rights importance, to be very important freedoms and rights that we need to advocate for. We were also happy to nurture a new generation of lawyers that is actually committed to promoting social justice, that is actually committed to advocating for and uh, uh, fighting for such freedoms as freedom of expression. I was part of some of the activities that resulted into the report that we are going to listen to today. I was privileged to supervise or co-supervise a team of uh, students that were working on, the, on, the, on one of the reports that we are launching today. I could see the passion that the students had. I could see the fact that the students were learning a lot. I could see that actually the students were slowly getting to know that they have the civic responsibility to promote freedom of expression and their related rights. The School of Law is committed to providing the space. We know that uh, the civic space is narrowing every day. However, we are committed to using our academic freedom in all ways to promote freedom of expression and other, and other rights. I look forward to listening to the presentation of the report as much as I was a part of one of the reports. Indeed, I, I look forward to the final product that is going to be presented. I look forward to listening to the presentation of the other reports that I was not part to. I look forward to the conversations and discussions and as a school of law, we are taking note of this and will uh, always provide the support whenever needed. I thank my colleagues that have worked on this, Asa and Sereko and the team. I also thank our partners that have supported this financially and technically, that's uh, among others, the American Bar Association, I see our colleague uh, is Mini, the is on the, on the line. A pleasure seeing you again after uh, some time. I hope to see you physically and other colleagues that have supported this in, uh, in various ways. Special tribute to the students, both our undergraduate and postgraduate students that uh, uh, engaged in the research and the authorship that resulted in the reports that we're going to present today. Thank you so much, Asa, and thank you so much, Asa, for the excellent moderation. Look forward to being with you here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor. La Actions speak louder than words. I hope the appreciation will come in form of a check now that we are coming to the end of the month. Thank you. Uh, yes, we welcome Gloria from Wema and Company Advocates. We have Diana Atenyi Ahumuza of the Public Interest Law Clinic. Glad to have you. We have Abdul Malik Bello of the Center for Human Rights, University of Pretoria, South Africa. Thank you for tuning in. Mrs. Sandra Oriema of the Public Interest Law Clinic, logging in from Kampala. Glad <laughs> to have you. Imachlet Owomugisha of Uganet. Thank you for being a good partner and for supporting these processes. Patricia 
Aima Onko of the Net Network of Public Interest Lawyers. Glad to have you. Prince Mukombe from both Macquarie University and the Rural Electrification Agency. He says he's honored to be here with us. We are also honored to have you. Manira Kiza Fred, Macquarie University. It is great to have you. Friends, allow me to invite the chairperson of the advisory committee of the network of public interest lawyers, who also doubles as the coordinator of uh, coalition oil and gas. If you look at his beard and his physical build, it really speaks oil and gas. Mr. James Mohindo, we are glad to have you. Uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, those uh, physically here present and uh, those attending uh, this engagement virtually. Uh, it's uh, with great pleasure that I would like to uh, add my voice to Professor Chris Voice to welcome you to this uh, very important launch of two studies. Uh, as you can see, most of the three studies all seem to focus on the issue of freedom of expression and then uh, elections. Those are two areas they are cross-cutting at. Uh, article 29 of the Constitution provides for the freedoms of expression, uh, association, and assembly. While on the face of these, uh, they may seem like civil and political rights, but these rights also help to create a platform uh, for one to be able to demand for the enjoyment of economic, social, and cultural rights. And this cannot be uh, better highlighted than during elections when citizens exercise this right by electing leaders who are going to be uh, mandated with uh, helping to ensure that Ugandans enjoy their rights uh, both civil and political, and also economic, social, and cultural rights. So this is a very, very important right that we always uh, make sure that whatever we can do, we should ensure that people enjoy it, because without enjoying uh, the freedom of expression, association, and assembly, many other rights may not be enjoyed. People will not be able to express themselves on matters that concern them. People will not be able to hold leaders accountable. People will not be able to demand uh, for economic, social, and cultural rights that are required for them to live a good life. So it's uh, my pleasure to thank the Network of Public Interest uh, Lawyers and uh, the Public Interest Law Clinic for helping to put these uh, studies together. In a special way, I would like to also appreciate uh, what PILAC is doing with students. As an alumni and a product of that system, I am really grateful that even at undergraduate level, we can have uh, students producing quality work that is shaping policy and national discourse. And I think uh, the students that put that together deserve a round of applause. Thank you very much for uh, shaping uh, the national discourse even before uh, you're done with undergraduate studies. Uh, it only serves to show how better what you're doing can become. Also thank other consultants that uh, supported this work and uh, look forward to listening to what the panelists that will be dissecting this work for us uh, will have to share. I wish everyone fruitful deliberation. Uh, Chair, it is not that I don't trust you. It is just that I'm not sure whether you are vaccinated. And that is why I had to sanitize the microphone. Our uh, friends, yes, uh, that is James Mohindo, the chairperson of the advisory committee of the Network of Public Interest Lawyers. Um, yes, without much ado, we are trying to chase time. Allow me to take this opportunity to invite one of our partners, development partners, and uh, that is um, 
the American Bar Association uh, Rule of Law Initiative. We are pleased to have Ms. Nicole Ismeni, who is the Senior Technical Advisor, Africa Division, the American Bar Association Rule of Law Initiative. I know this is um, an entity that is really interested in issues of uh, freedom of expression and universities. Madam Nicole, we're all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Arthur. I hope you can hear me. Um, good morning, um, Principal School of Law, Magdalene University. Um, thank you for the invitation for having me, distinguished panelists, members of the law school and other faculty members present, members of the media, guests, uh, students. Thank you so much for, for the invitation and for the opportunity to make a few remarks at this uh, important occasion, this long awaited. Um, I'd like to start by appreciating the organizers of this launch event and the authors of the three monitoring and documentation studies for a comprehensive and critical review of the events that have taken place over the past two years in the country. It's, a widely acknowledged, it's widely acknowledged that one of the core elements of a participatory democracy include the respect and exercise of fundamental rights, including the right and access to information. It's on this basis that members of society can meaningfully participate in civic and political life. The studies being launched today are not only notable for their content, analyzing recent events and raising questions about state practice in the context of a human rights-based framework, but are notably, but are noteworthy for their authorship, two of which were produced by students and promote the development and, of student scholarship and agency. Over the past two years, ABA has implemented a regional project to advance freedom of expression in East Africa. The project has emphasized legal aid provision for persons at risk, strategic litigation, research publications for advocacy, capacity building for lawyers and members of the law school faculties in Uganda and Tanzania. In this context, ABA established a partnership with the Network of Public Interest Lawyers, which aim to advance the respect for freedom of expression through the use of strategic litigation, research and advocacy. Equally, under the partnership, NECPIL established a rapid response legal aid fund to provide emergency legal assistance to those in need. They led several workshops to build capacity of lawyers within their membership and nurtured young lawyers and law graduates to actively engage in public interest lawyering. One of the components of the program has included an activity on monitoring and documentation designed to generate greater awareness and transparency surrounding recent events, practices, and trends that infringe on fundamental rights. It's in this context that the MDR reports are designed to contribute to the overall goals of the project. For its part, ABA has historically placed value on its partnerships with academic institutions, in particular law schools around the world, as well as supporting the establishment and growth of university-based law clinics, as they play a key role in enhancing access to justice for the most vulnerable, promoting pro bono lawyering, contributing to greater legal literacy among the population and overall contributing to a strong rule of law. In this context, the ABA would like to appreciate the partnership with the School of Law, Macadena University and the Public Interest Law Clinic for the impressive role that it's playing in promoting public interest lawyering, producing innovative research on access to justice for vulnerable persons and for training and engaging students to become tech <clears throat> technically skilled advocates and socially conscious members of the legal fraternity. A few words about the ABA Rule of Law Initiative. It's a division of the, a of the American Bar Association that works to promote the rule of law, access to justice, and respect for human rights across the globe. Its mission is to promote <clears throat> justice, economic opportunity, and human dignity through the rule of law. It achieves these ends through a combination of strategies, including capacity building, technical and financial assistance, strategic litigation, institution strengthening, and strategic partnerships with relevant state institutions and civil society. Its programming ranges in thematic coverage from promoting access to justice for the most vulnerable, promoting women's empowerment, 
providing support and protection to SGBV survivors and combating trafficking in persons, amongst others. It's historically held special relationships with national bar associations and universities as strategic partners in pursuing its mission. In Africa alone, ABA Roli is present in over a dozen countries with programming ranging from institution strengthening of national human rights institutions in Burkina Faso and Niger, atrocity prevention programming in Central African Republic and the DRC, support to the constitution making process in Sudan, assisting SGBV survivors in Sudan and Eswatini, capacity building of, of the security sector in Liberia and the justice sector in the Gambia, access to justice programming in Somalia and a regional human rights program in Southern Africa, spanning eight countries amongst others. In closing, I'd like to take this opportunity to express appreciation to the contributors of these three studies, all of the people who've been involved in making this um, day happen, to the experts, academics, and panelists present for sharing their views, and to the organizers of the launch event for stimulating debate about key issues and concerns that merit further discussion and analysis. I thank you. Thank you so much, Nicole. Oh, initiative. Asa, Asa, you are muted. Asa, you are muted. Oh, sorry. Okay. Now I need to rewind. Good. Uh, thank you so much all for coming through American Bar Association. Thank you for supporting universities in pushing for freedom of expression, assembly, and association. Uh, Isaiah Daniel Duco, Director, Consortium Limited. We're glad to have you. I can see Moses Masira, Mount Elgon Bukedi Media Organizer, to have you. Moses Agama, thank you for coming through from Kavale. He is a journalist. I can see Mogisha from Ntungamo of YCED Ntungamo. Thank you for coming through, friends. Let us know who you are, which organization, which institution. I know this is the moment that we have been waiting for. Um, allow me to move us on to the next stage of the program. Uh, at this phase, we are going to have the sharing of findings from the two studies that were conducted by the undergraduate students. This is the Freedom of Expression Association and Assembly in Uganda in light of uh, the Public Order Management Act 2013. And then the Freedom of Expression Assembly and Association, a passage for democracy in, their 2020, in the 2021 elections in Uganda. The first publication is a November 2020 release. The second publication is a June 2020. 21 released. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm privileged to let us know that the students behind this work are Luyombo Abbas, Etiang Timothy George, Kasamba Emmanuel, Mueva Ze Juliana, Nakakande Margaret, and Kule Roland, uh, the person that is manning the camera. 
Could you kindly zoom in in that table? Because I know not all of them are going to come in, but it is important for our participants to know who are behind these two great works. Kindly, as the person who is meant to present the findings of the first report makes his or her way here. Uh, join me in welcoming Luyombo Abbas, supported by Kule Roland, to take 15 minutes as he shares the findings from their first monitoring and documenting study. Abbas. Um, good morning to everyone with us. Uh, we thank all actors and participants on this particular launch. We are grateful for this opportunity. I am Abbas, Abbas Luyombo, a student of law in my fourth year of study. And I shall be presenting on the findings on the report that concerns the state of freedom of expression under the Public Order Management Act, which was published in November 2020. This study or report was informed by the desire to realize one, the response of political actors and all institutions to the Public and Order Management Act and then the enforcement organs, how they had used that particular law to regulate freedom of expression, assembly and association. This study was as a result of the fact that in the background, we had had the police act, which had been consistently used to regulate the gathering and freedoms of expression of the population. However, following the decision in the case of Mwanga Chivumbi versus Attorney General, where section 32 of the police act was declared unconstitutional that left then the enforcement organs with no particular outright law that could be used to regulate or permit holding of assemblies, which finally, of course, give birth to expression and association. Subsequently, that led to the enactment of the Public Order Management Act that almost reproduced the powers that were abolished in the police act and such powers again were given to the police to regulate public gatherings, to give permissions to those who want to gather and express themselves or associate. associate. This law was immediately challenged by various parties and the judgment was not rendered not until 2020. However, before the judgment was rendered, we embarked on the study to find out how enforcement organs had used this particular law to regulate freedom of expression, assembly, and association, and how political parties and other actors had related with this particular law and enforcement organs to see that they can enjoy their freedoms of expression, assembly, and association. And consequently, as the, our study involved research from political parties, research from civil society organizations, research from the enforcement organs, and in that particular process, various challenges were encountered, but that did not stop the publication and the gathering of all the relevant information, which challenges among others included the unwillingness of 
various players to share key information and the phobia by various victims of the law to express their experience and also share what steps they took to confront challenges they faced or even then what sparked off some of the challenges they faced. However, they were those that were free to ex freely express themselves. And that possibly to us pointed to the fact that beyond the law, there is a syndrome of freedom of expression being sabotaged by the fear of the people being watched by an invisible human. And to that extent, possibly with or without a law, there is more to it to be done to see that people can freely express themselves without the fear of being watched by an invisible human somewhere. However, in terms of our findings, we realized that one, there was maximum restriction of freedom of assembly and gathering to those who held views that were contrary to those that are believed to be right by those holding power. That is to say, political parties in opposition were strictly controlled on when should they gather, how should they gather, and for what reason should they gather for. They were given quite unfair conditions so as to gather and unfair terms to be made so as, they, so as to hold assemblies or gathering to pass on information to the people concerned. This therefore stopped many of them from holding assemblies, gatherings, and freely expressing themselves because of the fear of the violation of the law. And those who attempted to hold these assemblies they were frustrated through either dispersing them by the police or arresting many of them when they chose to carry out some of these assemblies. Subsequently, the application of the law was extended beyond political assemblies to even social gathering whose application was equally selective in manner of enforcement. That is to say, music shows were restricted, weddings, birthday, birthday parties, among others, and these were strictly controlled when they were considered to be attended by those whose views are offending to those in authority. This therefore restricted freedom of expression greatly because it is expected that under freedom of expression, you give space for those even who hold views that are offensive to you and shock the conscience of those in authority and those who do not agree with them. That is to say, for as long as people have the rights to express themselves, that expression includes the right to dissent from those views that are held by either the majority or the minority. However, in our findings, it was clear that the application of the law became so wide, that is to say it moved beyond merely political assemblies that initially were targeted. It included social gatherings, and these social gatherings were selectively restricted with various terms that were given to different parties in view of where you come why you have asked for the platform to express yourself or the political views that you hold. For example, in our interaction with some of the political players and social actors, they argued that whenever they applied to have their assemblies or gatherings, they were asked to, uh, to, have, metal detect to have metal detectors, to own ambulances, to have large spaces, and a number of very unfair terms, which their unfairness springs from the fact that other players who held possibly similar assemblies or similar gatherings 
we are not required to fulfill the same conditions. This greatly restricted freedom of expression and subsequently had a spillover effect to other rights, which included among others, freedom of association, access to information, and the fact that people would not freely express the ideas of dissent that are perceived to be respected in a system that is democratic. Furthermore, subsequently, as a result of the finding, there was a gross violation of the obligation of the state to respect, protect, and fulfill the freedoms of expression. This is because the law was consistently used to frustrate assemblies of those who held opposing views to the government, and it was never used to protect those whose views are either held by the minority or they are offending, but they, it was only used to suppress such persons with such views. And subsequently, as a result of the failure to protect and respect, then the fulfillment was no longer possible. However, in the process of these findings and in the process of the research happening, the Constitutional Court delivered a judgment in March 2020 that declared Section 8, among others, of the Public Order Management Act as unconstitutional. And that therefore meant that the heart of the Public Order Management Act was destroyed. And that therefore remained to create a situation of seeing how freedom of expression, assembly, association would then be restricted when the law that was used to restrict these freedoms had been declared unconstitutional. And then that opened a window of waiting for a great enjoyment of the freedom of expression by all citizens and all actors in the country. However, such nullification came at the time when COVID-19 had been declared in the country. And subsequently, it was discovered that then regulations and rules that were meant to restrict the spread of COVID-19 replaced the Public Order Management Act. And subsequently, it was never cited again as the regulation or the rule that restricts how people should relate, how people should express themselves. But then it was now the rules on COVID that were used to restrict freedoms of expression, assembly, and association for the citizens. As a result of that, these rules came in at the time when the country is preparing for elections. And subsequently, as you shall be informed after here, that occasioned then the next study to trace the impact of these particular rules and other restrictions to freedom of expression at the time when it was expected that the respect and protection of freedom of expression would be uplifted since the law that was used to restrict them was then declared unconstitutional. However, as I conclude, in view of our report, it's important for us to reflect on the fact that as we think of freedoms of expression, assembly, gathering and association, in a situation where laws like the Public Order Management Act have been declared unconstitutional. And well, as we also still have the challenge of COVID that has been used by some authoritarian systems to restrict freedom of expression, assembly and association of the citizens, how have other spaces then been used by the citizens to express themselves or to assemble to, so as to freely express their views. That is to say, the virtual spaces that people use, do we think then currently we are having the freedom of expression we need physically to gather and do all that we desire? Do we think at the time when it is oppressed at the maximum, virtual spaces solve all these problems for us? And if they don't, then what do we have to do 
to create an active citizenry and to create more spaces that we can use to freely express ourselves, to freely assemble and share our views widely. Even then, beyond the freedom of expression that was, that was restricted under the Public Order Management Act, where we could not gather, assemble, what of other means that people use to express themselves either through colors? How much space have they been accorded to see that they express themselves under such means of expression? That therefore means, well, as our findings pointed at, pointed at a very big challenge of how the state has often used the law to restrict freedom of expression and how various victims had suffered as a result of the enforcement of the law and even where mechanisms that are used to enforce or to offer redress to those whose rights have been violated. There was a lot of fear for the victims to use such avenues to have their rights to have their rights secured or to have their freedoms secured and protected or to get remedy from the violations they, have, they had received. They did not successfully pursue such measures. We must then think of how have alternative spaces of freedom of expression been used to see that we can enjoy our rights as citizens, as country, and as the world at large. And as I conclude, we want to thank NetPill once again for the space and platform that was given to see that this first study was carried out and to share the findings, which must spark off then a debate to the entire country and the world at large on how do we move from where we are to a next stage. And also to give space to we, the students, to have a practical experience of how democracy plays out in the spaces outside our classrooms and how then we, what role we can play to see that we achieve the rights of those, of, those, of, of those persons who are suppressed and create spaces for those who are suffering. But also the study which they occasioned, which they, which they supported that finally helped us go into the next study that all surrounded, uh, surrounded freedom of expression. We are grateful to NetPill and all the partners who work with them for such support, technical guidance, and all the assistance that has been given to us, the students who are doing the research, but even support that they give to student movements in terms of activism and to see that they freely express themselves and they see to it that they lay a foundation for the nations and the community we want to live in as the students' community. Thank you so much. And it is as a result of that report, which I have presented above, that it led to the next study, which we also did carry out a research. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That is Abbas Luyombo. If Abbas leaves the podium without talking about activism, then that is not him. Bus and team for the first study, the State of Freedom of Expression Association and Assembly in Uganda in light of the Public Order Management Act. We shall move on to the next study, which is the uh, Freedom of Expression Assembly and Association, a pursuit for democracy in the 2021 elections in Uganda. Please. Morning, ladies. 
Very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am Julian Mwewaze, a fourth year student of law at Macquarie University, and I'm part of the Ned Hill Students Chapter. Uh, with me is my team that I worked on the second project together with Bas and Roland, and uh, will take us through our findings for the second report, which is Freedom of Expression, Assembly and Association, a pursuit for democracy in the 2021 elections in Uganda. Uh, Abbas has already given the general background, but um, just clarify, um, there are a few pointers that guided our research. Sorry, that guided our findings. Um, first of all, the freedom of expression, the freedom. The freedom of expression, association, and assembly are most relevant during election period. However, these freedoms are not absolute and they may be limited in certain instances. Uh, the, the COVID pandemic is one such instance where these rights may be limited um, in pursuit of public health. So um, a, justifiable, a justifiable limitation on these freedoms must be prescribed by law, must pursue a legitimate aim, in this case, public health, and uh, the limitation must be necessary to achieve said aim. However, in as much as these freedoms might be limited, um, first of all, the limitation must not take away the essence of the right, the basic essence of the right. Um, and secondly, uh, the limitation must at all times be proportionate. So um, the basis of our findings was to uh, look at the scientific election model as was adopted by the Electoral Commission during the campaigns and the election season last year uh, in order to curb the spread of the pandemic. Uh, we intended to find out, uh, to draw a nexus between the theory and the practice, to find out whether the limitation on on these freedoms of expression, association, and assembly were indeed justified and proportionate in as far as we were pursuing uh, the election period. Uh, our research was mostly in East and Central Uganda because uh, these areas had the most clashes with the uh, uh, law enforcement authorities. And without further ado, I'll take us through uh, the findings of our study. Our findings followed uh, certain broad themes. Uh, we looked at the compliance with and the application of the COVID-19 regulations that were adopted. And uh, following the, the ban on most physical gatherings, uh, regulations, were put in, sorry, regulations were put in place which involved the banning of most physical gatherings. So we intended to find out uh, how the law enforcement authorities how the law enforcement authorities enforce these regulations. Um, the, the most outstanding finding was that there's a lot of violence and oppression in the enforcement of these regulations. And um, this was very partisan. Most of our respondents uh, were, most of our respondents opined that certain political parties, especially certain political parties, faced more oppression from the authorities compared to others. For example, the ruling party, the ruling party and all their rallies and their gatherings were usually uh, let off the hook. They could gather, they could hold these rallies. Uh, while on the other hand, most opposition party gatherings and rallies were restricted by the, by the enforcement authorities. However, some of our respondents, especially in the central region, well, the opinion that um, these regulations were effectively and fairly enforced. Uh, they were of the opinion that, um, one of our respondents was of the opinion that people, the citizens, were being very reckless in as far as protecting their health was concerned. And so the police was doing what they had to do in order to curb the spread of the pandemic. 
Mm, however, most of our respondents uh, were of the view that there's a lot of partisan application of these regulations. Um, in as far as the conduct of law enforcement goes, uh, there's a lot of brutality. There's a lot of arbitrary arrest. There's a lot of um, arresting people without any, without any sufficient explanations. Um, and the police was very oppressive, like I said earlier. Uh, one of our respondents was from a civil society organization, and he expressed how they were always uh, securing bond for so many people the next day. And in most instances, uh, people were kept in detention for such a long time, and yet the constitution requires these people should be kept in detention for only 48 hours. Um, the violence and brutality also incited a lot of fear among the population. So people often prefer to just stay in their homes and not to do anything. So um, yeah. Um, however, another respondent, some other respondents opined that politicians often liars with the police to arrest them in order to gain popularity. So while we had some respondents uh, complaining that there's a lot of arbitrary arrest, others were uh, of the opinion that, that the population and the citizens were merely, uh, okay, basically that they were just trying to make the state look bad. Also, um, one of our respondents was, um, law enforcement officer and he mentioned how other citizens were very were not interested in public health generally that they preferred to just run around and chase their candidates rather than protecting their health and um, because of the bias against law enforcement authorities civil societies will often think that the state is the oppressor and yet they were just trying to preserve public health um, however, most of our respondents did not agree with this view. Um, so the gist of our findings, the most outstanding was that um, the COVID-19 COVID regulations and this enforcement were merely a scapegoat uh, to suppress uh, the freedom of expression and but especially association to prevent people from associating and expressing their opinions in as far as their political allegiance was concerned. Um, also, the police was very intent on frustrating the human rights of the people uh, in the guise of, of curbing the spread of the pandemic. Um, the second theme was with regard to access to radio stations. Now with a physical, with a, with a ban on physical gatherings, uh, most, most candidates had to take their campaigns to the radio stations. They had to use these radio stations to express themselves and submit their manifestos. However, in our focus group discussion with um, a, a very, with a particular radio station in Eastern Uganda, um, they expressed a lot of um, a lot of discomfort or um, they weren't happy with the regulations upon which they were enforced. First of all, they asserted that um, the UCC set very high tax rates during the election period. Now, because of this, uh, getting airtime on radio was very expensive. And as such, most political candidates could not, most political candidates, sorry, could not afford this airtime and as such they could not access these radio stations in order to uh, speak to the population. Uh, we must keep in mind that this is the only means that these candidates had to speak to the population. Um, however, oh, another issue that was complained about was um, various threats from the UCC uh, this particular radio station in Eastern Uganda spoke of how they were often threatened by the UCC every time they allowed an opposition candidate to speak on their radio. And as such, they, were, they went into self-censorship 
uh, they did not speak about most of these political issues and uh, they only allowed candidates from the ruling party to access these radio stations. Um, uh, as a result, there's a lot of, there's limited access to information about political candidates. And in fact, one of our respondents expressed that even on election day, the number of political candidates she saw on the ballot paper and she had never heard of them. Um, about the enforcement of the curfew, most of our respondents expressed that um, curfew was merely a money-making scheme and does, it was applied in a way that was not regular. So in some instances, curfew would be at seven and then in another instance, you arrested at five because um, because you are in violation of curfew. And um, the reason was that um, they were trying to, again, curb the spread of COVID-19. However, uh, on arrest for violation of this curfew or any other regulations really, um, the suspects were always put in overcrowded prisons. Now, um, the general idea was that if these regulations were put in place to curb the spread of COVID-19, they would not be putting um, the suspects in overcrowded prisons because this was counterproductive. So while saying this, our respondents would often say that that, that shows that these regulations were really not meant to preserve public health, but they were mostly political. Um, the other theme we were investigating was the reporting of abuses. For example, if the police is very brutal or um, uh, long periods of detention or any kind of abuse of one's rights really. Um, now, most of our respondents expressed that um, they did not report any of the abuses. If a police officer was brutal or violent, they preferred to keep quiet about it because they did not want to get into any further trouble. Um, then um, the civil society respondent that we had said that most of the people were unaware of their rights. Most of the people were unaware of the fact that they could report a violation, especially a brutality. So they often kept quiet about it. Um, then on the election day, the voter turn up for the presidential elections was still high despite the brutality but the turn up was low for the local government elections and our respondents opined that this was because of the general fear and the general fear during the presidential elections because of the heavy deployment of military personnel. Um, another of our respondents talked about how it was, it was kind of an unspoken rule that you would not openly uh, confess your allegiance to a certain opposition party. As long as you are um, in support of an opposition party, you would not openly talk about it because uh, you'd, you'd um, attract comments like, are you sure you want to do that? Or are you sure you want to know what prison feels like? Or are you sure you know what you are talking about? So this spoke of a general environment of fear and tension and we found this to be a very chilling effect on freedom of expression. Um, our respondents also talked of uh, minimal privacy at the voting spaces uh, because um, one would be voting at the ballot box, but then there are police officers right next to them. So they opined that it was very difficult for them to freely to freely vote for whichever candidate they wanted. Um, also, there's an internet shutdown on election day, as we all know. Uh, so most of our respondents think that they, they were not able to really talk about the elections and their candidates with most of their colleagues online. Um, there's also, we also encountered a general challenge of fear and reluctance to get responses to our questions, which we attributed to, which we attributed to the, um, the brutality and the violence that was going on throughout the entire campaign season. So in summary, um, 
our findings were that the COVID-19 regulations in as far as they were meant to preserve public health were mostly politicized and were used to um, further the interests of the ruling party and um, discriminately applied against opposition candidates. There's a lot of brutality and violence during the election period in the guise of um, enforcing these COVID-19 regulations. Uh, curfew was enforced in a very irregular manner. Reporting of abuses, human rights abuses was very minimal. Um, there's a lot of the use of an iron fist generally. And this had the effect of chilling people's ability to express themselves and do this in association with others. Um, our general recommendations uh, were that there's need for more sensitization about the uh, COVID-19 regulations in order to make people aware about their rights so they know when these are being violated. But most of all, the fair implementation of COVID-19 regulations in order to ensure that public health is preserved, but without limiting the freedom of expression, association, and assembly. Um, uh, because these rights must not be sacrificed at the altar of public health. Uh, from my team and I, we're very grateful to the net to the NetPill team for allowing us to take on this research and this and find everything that we need. Uh, we learned a lot. We are so we're most grateful. Um, I think that's it from me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Julian, for that for presenting those uh, findings from that report. Our friends, we are here to launch three works of uh, law students from the School of Loma Cray University. I always wonder what the TV talk show moderators feel like as they talk to the public and cameras are in front of them. I'm glad I've got the opportunity today. Thank you, Luyombo Abbas, Etiang Timothy, Kasamba Emmanuel, Mueva Julian, Nakakande Margaret, and Kule Roland. You have some feedback in the chat room. Somebody says, the state's obligation to respect, protect, and fulfill remains a mockery in view of the universal periodic review responsibility. I am sure the state has heard. Dr. Sylvia Nambiru of Last Minute says, the presentation by the students are informative and relevant to the times in which we are. Thank you so much, Tim, for that great work. Um, we are going to take a commercial break, but a constructive commercial break, uh, in which we are going to have the students that did participate in uh, these two documentations share these, their experiences by way of a documentary. Ladies and gentlemen, Join me in watching and listening in to the students' experiences. Admin. The network of public interest lawyers is an umbrella body that brings together individual lawyers, law firms, non-government organizations, and institutions that are interested in pursuing public interest litigation. The network's mandate largely centers around promoting but also supporting public interest lawyering and litigation. NetPeo was founded in 2015 and is a brainchild of the Public Interest Law Clinic at the School of Law, Macquarie University. Our vision is a legal profession committed to serving the justice needs of society. And our mission is to promote and strengthen public interest lawyering 
in pursuit of social justice and human rights. So we do this through litigation, definitely. We do this through advocacy. We do this through research. We do this through information dissemination. And all our processes are aimed at supporting strategic litigation. Being university-based, our core target is the student, the law student. And so as a network, we do nurture, we do model, and we do mentor young lawyers or young law students to consider a practice in public interest litigation. And when we're implementing some of these activities, uh, we, we mainly work with students in various universities. And in the past 18 months, we've been implementing a project on freedom of expression and assembly. And we've been working with students in monitoring, documentation, and reporting of violations of freedom of expression and assembly during the election period, and also working on the Public Order Management Act in relation with freedom of expression. These students are going to be sharing their reflections and experiences on working on these activities. Freedom of expression is the ability of people to express their views regardless of what those views maintain, even contain, even when they are shocking to the conscience of those in authority or those offended by them, even when they are opposed to them, the ability they have to express them freely and they are given space to be heard, that amounts to freedom of expression. Basically, you have the space to express yourself, you have the freedom to express your views, and your views can be, re can be accessed by other people without any limitation. We, with NetPew, we've worked on uh, two projects, or two research projects. That is one that is involved with the freedom of expression in light of the Public, in Public Order Management Act, or that one which is popularly known as the POMA. And then uh, freedom of expression, under the 2020, in, in light of the 2021 general elections. So under the POMA, we are trying to understand how POMA affects the rights, especially freedom of expression, association and assembly in Uganda. And then uh, under the 2021 freedom of expression research, we are trying to understand or to study the effects of the COVID-19 guidelines uh, directives and other orders on the freedom of expression assembly association and assembly in Uganda. So in those two researches, I should say in those two projects, it was our finding oh, that uh, actually freedom of expression in Uganda continues to be haunted, if I may say, by the law. So every time you realize that people are having much freedom, then you as the government, you go behind and then try to come up with something that is trying to take away this freedom. And with that one, we found out a lot about how uh, people were being stopped from gatherings in a partisan manner, right? So some people with different political affiliations were allowed to gather and, and air out their political opinions with each other, but then others were not allowed. And the justification was um, that they had not asked for permission under the Public Order Management Act or, you know, there were different sections in the act that didn't allow people to gather without police police uh, support at your rally or political rally. However, um, the police in some instances denied some groups that access. What I discovered from this project is that uh, from the comments we were getting from some of the respondents, it looked like um, there was a sort of disconnection between information being passed down through the local leaders because um, the first time the people were hearing about the regulations that came with, uh, with COVID, they were hearing it from the policemen who already came to enforce. They didn't have that opportunity to get to hear it from the local leaders that could probably make it uh, easier for them to respond to the rules that were being given. So that's what I discovered primarily. The most outstanding discovery that I made personally was um, the chaos that ensued during the scientific election period 
uh, especially because there's a lot of tension that continued to prevail in these societies even after these elections. There seemed to be a general environment of fear because even as we interviewed a number of people, only, not only the general uh, citizens, but also people from media houses and then uh, uh, people who were recently released from RS during the election period, they were very reluctant to give us information, to give us the data that we're looking for. So most of the questions were either avoided or just not answered. So you'd ask someone something and then they probably just laugh it off and say, I don't want to be arrested like probably my neighbor, yeah? So, um, and then in another place where we went, we were supposed to meet around four respondents and all of them refused to show up. So either they thought we were spies, I don't know, but there's a lot of tension and reluctance to give the information that you are looking for. So basically my major discovery through the whole research was that there was a lot of suppression of people's ability and their will to express themselves. I was shocked the, the phobia and fear people had to express themselves in view of what was transpiring throughout the entire election period. And people we would never express themselves freely. People's spirits were so down and they were destroyed or broken to the point that people who had various views they could either say them in silence or even abstain from speaking what they felt and even fear to express themselves before anyone because self-censorship was set into people and so it was really problematic but for me it was a great learning experience having an interaction with people understanding their perspectives and views but even their fears which make them fail to express themselves and even offer solutions to that which they can avoid. I've come to really see that Ugandans do not really enjoy the freedom of expression as guaranteed by the constitution. People fear to get some knowledge or people also try to get knowledge and are not given access to the knowledge. We have seen several times when there has been censorship on what has been always seen as something that might be anti-government. We have also seen situations where people have been limited from accessing information. For instance, when the internet has been shut down. We have also seen instances where people are not given information they are required to have. Then in the second uh, research project on freedom of expression in under scientific elections during COVID-19, we were looking at how the state decided that even though COVID was happening, um, the, the, elections, the elections would happen, so they refused uh, gatherings for like more than 60 people. And then they also refused people to campaign after curfew periods and all that. However, when we were conducting our research in the different parts of the country, we found out that uh, some people again were allowed to gather while others were not. And yet um, freedom of expression is supposed to be that everyone has the ability to express their opinions, their individual opinions without fear of censorship from the government. So, yeah. And we've also found out that since in COVID time, scientific elections, political campaigners had to use radio stations and online social media platforms for that. However, the UCC came up with different regulations that hindered several political parties, mostly opposition parties, from going on with their campaigns while it was easier for other parties to be able to do that. This experience and research was very fundamental in my studies and among the lessons learned it is that self-censorship or creation of a police state is a starting point of violation of the freedom of expression even before denying people spaces to do so you can create all these spaces you can have radio stations you can have televisions you can have newspapers where people can express themselves but for as long as there is a police state self-censorship among people then you have killed the soul of the freedom of expression and when the soul is broken 
then there is nothing that we can do to prepare people to have that freedom of expression. But I also learned the importance of building civic competence among people because I, either the intention or accidental mistake of the state to fail to build civic competence amongst the population consistently created this fear, consistently made people abstain from expressing themselves freely and that in itself was a starting point of the breakage of the freedom of expression. The research has, has had, a, I should say, a two-way impact both on me as an individual and a student and then at the moment it is not yet published because of uh, COVID-19 restrictions on assembly and, and association but I believe once it is published our audience here which is the media, uh, the parliament of Uganda or even other public interest lawyers and, and other persons interested in advocacy the research is aimed at showing to them the extent to which freedom of expression has been limited in Uganda. Having the right in the constitution is one thing, but also uh, having it limited is another thing. So we want this, these different entities to realize and be able to come up with maybe a solution. If just, you know, not just a solution, but a way forward. If we are making recommendations that maybe there is need to change the law, there is need to to tighten or to loosen up here and there, then it is the duty of these advocacy groups that are outside there, the CSOs and the lawyers that are in the, in the field, to challenge these laws that try to limit freedom of expression. On an individual level, or on a uh, student level, the projects, the two projects have enabled me to not just understand what freedom of expression is, but also to unpack freedom of expression properly. Not just limiting it to, to speaking, writing, and maybe drawing certain things, but also to singing, to, to just even standing. You may even stand and look at someone and that is enough expression for the other person to know what you're meaning. Yes, so freedom of expression has announced my understanding, first of all, of uh, what the extent of the right is and what the test is for the any limitation that has to be brought against the right. The lesson I picked from this experience, the first is the difference in what we actually pick from class and what you apply in the field. Uh, not that what we pick from class is not important because of course that legal knowledge is what establishes us as lawyers. But um, when you go to the field, that's not the first thing that is going to be necessary in order to get what you want from the person. What you actually need at that point in time is the ability to talk to the person and find out and ask the right questions so that they can give you the answers you need in order to to what to help with your project. Also, it was the, the, the part where you have to actually now respect um, the fear or the, or the different emotions that these respondents might have because for this particular project it was a sensitive one because we were just coming from the elections. Some of the respondents had been arrested and actually some totally, totally refused to speak to us. So you had to be careful to ask um, questions which wouldn't even sort of force them to have, should I say, a side that they are supporting. Then um, another thing that, that stood out again to me which I found important was the, actually the importance of social justice. Importance because um, for some of these people, they actually wouldn't have been released if uh, the different social justice activists weren't around. I was able to relate most of the theory that I've studied from class and have read about to the practice, like what's out there. And there's a lot of divergence between the two because we have, for example, international standards of human rights, especially freedom of expression, association and assembly. But then in reality, there are areas in Uganda, for example, where these rights are not just being suppressed, but they are non-existent as a whole. So um, this being my first field work, I learned that there is so much social justice that is still lacking, especially for marginalized areas and districts. And um, I also 
think I would like to pursue a career in the monitoring and documenting of human rights violations, which still continue to go on. Uh, then um, I also learned the role of civil society organizations such as Netfield in helping these people out there in the field to express themselves or to report on violations that have been inflicted on them. We really think there is still a long way to go. There has to be political will. There has to be political will to let citizens or Ugandans enjoy their freedom. There also has to be a middle ground between enjoyment because well, there are some people who might be affected by what is disseminated. But there should be a balance between those who disseminate and those who have to receive. People ought to be given a right to choose what they receive and the freedom to leave what they don't want to receive. I shouldn't be dictated upon what kind of social media to use or what not to use. So I think and do believe that maybe the authorities should help people enjoy their rights by not putting into place avenues that block them from enjoying their rights. The people who are responsible for these violations need to be brought to book and they must they must be held accountable for the things that they are doing. But then you find that most of the people who are um, responsible for these violations are the law usually so they will easily get away with these things at the expense of the citizens whose rights continue to be violated with impunity so if we could have accountability mechanisms that are very effective this would really go a long way so I should say in both research proje projects it is it was our discovery that actually freedom of expression in Uganda is a reality on paper but not actually in existence. It is just provided for on paper but not in reality. You can't say you will be able to, to do or speak what you wish or what you expect but there is always a legal sanction coming after you. The legality of the law is another thing which our projects have also been able to question and then uh, the, 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 freedom of, the freedom is there in the constitution. So the limitation is what we need to, to deal, deal away with. The students have been shared these findings of their research. The, we are going to disseminate the findings and their recommendations in their report to the various stakeholders and duty bearers. These include the judiciary, the members of parliament, the executive, and the general public. I would like to thank the students who have worked with NetPeel. Wow, I know we have opportunity to give a, a virtual thumbs up, a hand clap, physical hand clap to the students. And that is their learning experience. And we must appreciate the School of Law for the opportunity given to law students to have a practical learning of the law. Uh, congratulations to the, to the six on uh, those two publications. Our uh, friends, we are doing well on time. And uh, finally, we come to the third report, which is the, tw two thousand, the 2021 general elections in Uganda, human rights violations, and the spectacle of violence. Uh, allow me, ladies and gentlemen, to invite James Nkubi, uh, one of the members of the postgraduate team of students that did this monitoring and documentation. He will share a few highlights of uh, what is in the report, and then uh, we will go into a plenary session. Uh, as James puts his work together, oh, it speaks of a PhD candidate, wow. As James puts this together, uh, we are privileged to have Charles Mwangrisha, who is going to moderate the panel. Charles, you may take your seat. Um, Charles will be joined by 
other people whom you will introduce. James, we are all yours. Thank you, uh, Arthur. Uh, and to the colleagues who have been here earlier, uh, my name is James, James Nkubi, Liombia. Uh, in this category, I'm, I'm the chair uh, of the NetPill Working Group on Civil and Political Rights. Uh, this working group is within the wider uh, mandate uh, of NetPill, uh, and our agenda is to continuously uh, monitor the trends of civil and political rights in this country uh, with a view of influencing them for the better. It is under this same uh, species that we undertook um, a monitoring and documentation, uh, you could call it an operation if you wish, because it was largely covered. Uh, and the idea uh, was that we could not, and we didn't, and we made sure we are not constrained by the rules of uh, observers, we were not observers, but we were interested in following up uh, to see how the election was uh, being conducted and whether it was matching uh, the particular uh, legal framework uh, in this country. We discovered a number of things which many people know. Uh, we have called our report the spectacle of violence because according to some people, uh, this was one of the most violent prone, um, violent or violence characterized uh, elections probably since uh, the introduction or the reintroduction of the multi-party dispensation in 2005. Of course, uh, this fact-finding mission uh, fits the other modalities that I won't go into time uh, uh, for the sake of time into defining the methodology and so forth. And uh, our findings do not differ much from what people saw, but as NetPill, we are interested in discussing what our findings mean for this country. And that is the essence of my discussion in the next 23 minutes. When we sat down, we concluded that having findings is important, but interrogating what the findings mean is key, especially in the context of uh, um, uh, the current political terrain that we are operating uh, into. And uh, whereas our particular monitoring uh, was centered on around six themes, that is the right to life and physical integrity, the right to freedom of uh, peaceful assembly, like my colleagues are, they have discussed um, expression. We're also interested in two other particular issues. The prosecution of individuals who are accused of crimes committed during uh, the elections, but also we're interested in the general election violence uh, that characterized uh, the entire period, right from the pre-election uh, uh, season to the particular day of election and the immediate aftermath. And we stretched this aftermath up to the swearing in day because uh, there is a lot of uh, untold um, violations that happened between the vote, the tally, and the 3rd of February when we finalized all the polls and up to the 12th of, uh, of May. Now, there are six things or seven that I want us to discuss here, um, even to those of you who have joined us online, that we found that we are very interested. Of course, under that theme. One, which we think are key for our country, even as we move forward for the next five years, one is the ethnicization, uh, or regionalization uh, of political discontent. We witnessed uh, what is an emerging delegitimization of discontent, especially if it has a regional aspect, or if you can paint an ethnicity around it. Because 
we, we are lawyers, we, we speak what we saw. And factually, uh, the violence that was witnessed, particularly in the post disappearances uh, in the Buganda region or the central region, has unfortunately brought back the undertone connotations of what it means when uh, regions show political discontent and what kind of uh, state response is manifest in such a situation. We think as not feel this is a critical issue going forward in our country. Is it criminal for a regional uh, political show of this content uh, to receive the state proofless like uh, the one we witnessed, especially uh, as manifesting the enforced disappearances. So that's one very interesting key. Why is this uh, in interesting for us is because in our findings, almost all 90% of the enforced disappearances that happened uh, in the aftermath and there before in this election uh, were from a particular region. And when we interviewed people who were coming out, they gave us different connotations that unfortunately had the same thread of what they used to be told in activity or in involuntary detention. So I think this is a very interesting issue uh, to look at. Number two is what we saw as the current contestation between national security and human rights. A, a very ruthless contestation going on that was manifest in this election. Because as you know, that an election is the optimization of the right to political participation of any citizen, the epitome really. And it's the optimization of freedom of expression, like colleagues were already saying, of freedom of association and so forth. We discovered that practically all chapter four guarantees were in contest with national security, either painted as such by those who define national security or actually as a reality. Now, the problem with national security is the nebulous nature of it and the ambiguity that surrounds it. That I can define national security as I wish for my own agenda because I define it. And to the colleagues who do human rights and they're watching, this is a discussion that we have to revisit. How do you balance the contest? We shouldn't be there, by the way between uh, the need, which again cannot be undermined, the need for national security and cohesion vis-a-vis -vis people who are enjoying uh, their rights. Because as you will notice in the report, when you get it, that uh, the state was very emphatic that whatever it was doing was for national security. Maybe the time is now to actually dig deeper into what are the limits how far can the state go in actually watering down chapter four in the name of national security? Of course, there will be replies, what I'm saying. And you see the replies will be actually attuning to what I'm saying that some people have defined national security as they do wish for it to be defined. So that contest continues incidentally, but it is responsible the violence we saw in November 9th, rather 18th and 19th, which we reported uh, and we reached a conclusion as maybe later on, as I will share that these were extrajudicial uh, uh, killings. Number three, which we note, is the deployment of military justice as an arbiter of political contestation. To date, uh, a number of people are still battling out uh, uh, charges. A number of civilians, we must say, they're battling out charges uh, in the military court 
uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is not a mere trial going on of these people. Uh, admittedly, we dare to assert that this is a deployment, systematic and deliberate of what is or was hitherto a professional force, and then using it optimistically, particularly its justice arm, to try and set a scores of people you know you can't sustain a charge in civilian courts. So what do you do? You retreat to the area that you control. If you don't control an area, and there are people who you want actually to be dealt with in that area, you will always lure them to the area uh, that you do control. And, and for us, when we look at the cases, when we look at the charges, when we look at the recent decision of the uh, Constitutional Court, we think and we hold the opinion which is backed by evidence, as you see from the report, that actually these charges, or in this election, we saw the military playing an upper hand, not in the usual way we know, but in the plausible invocation of the UPDF Act. Again, under the flagship of this is the law. So that is a, a third issue that as not feel, we consider that is key not only as a finding but also as an indicator of why we need to begin this discourse. To what extent should the military court go? Of course, the national court has helped us to a certain level. We can only hope that uh, the Supreme Court also uh, attunes itself to the same. Number four, again, as our finding, is of course we found that people we are shot and killed is an official number 54. In our findings, which also uh, uh, involved us accessing post-mortem reports, we come to a conclusion, I said to you, that majority of these cases actually were extrajudicial killings. In law, we are talking about the state opening up and firing at people unarmed and taking their lives away. The state we all know can kill, uh, but the confines are known in the constitution and they must be met. And the confines are so rigorous that in some situations, the Supreme Court must confirm such decisions. Now, that finding of the extrajudicial killings, it's a finding fine, but what does it tell us, which is our fourth agenda here is the continued normalization, normalization in this country of extrajudicial killings. And once we know, how do we normalize it? We, we dehumanize the dead by turning them into statistics. So at one time we even debated statistics. <laughs> no, there were, there were 32. No, 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 there were 54. No, there were 100. Ladies and gentlemen, behind these statistics are people. And this trend has been uh, em emerging and it is taking a stronghold. And as not be, we refuse to let this go. Who killed those 54 people? And under what circumstances were they gunned down? We, we still believe that the president's report which he asked that uh, should be undertaken will come out. But we look beyond, we choose to look beyond that extrajudicial killing as a killing, but we are also asking why should the state, why should the public normalize and actually reduce uh, uh, such tragedies uh, to statistical debates as words again? Because we think this is dehumanization. Uh, which is contrary to the right to life as well as powers in our constitution. That's, that's the fourth aspect from our findings in it. The fifth is a question of institutional capture and co-optation of private entities. In this election, we saw uh, the state 
uh, going ahead without fear to capture and, and in a real, real literal sense of the word, three of the most fundamental entities that were supposed to determine this election, or three, I mean three, the UCC and their directives uh, that uh, populated this entire electoral period. And then we, we can't run away that uh, the independence of the electoral commission continues to uh, again come back up every election. We choose not to look at it as independence per se, but as a potential interrogatory aspect of uh, institutional capture. And we can have a bigger debate on that as well. No, but, we, but also we were exposed to cooptation, where particular private institutions were co-opted into fulfilling agendas that were not legal. Or if they were legal, they were suspect in terms of uh, agenda. Again, being net, we are cautious. In our report, we direct you in what we think were public entities or private entities that were co-opted, including media. including media. And this cooperation should not be looked at it in the context of the weaklings of or, or these other private entities being weaklings, but it's actually a question of survival. But what must you do in this electoral period to render you relevant in the next or in the aftermath uh, of the election? And we choose not to look at these as, as sellouts or weaklings or whatever. Uh, but as entities that are also in the wider spectrum of what all of us actually find ourselves into, the need to unchain um, some of uh, uh, these uh, uh, rights and freedoms. Six, as a near conclusion, is the dictatorial authoritarianism that we witnessed. Uh, and Uganda was applying both the China model and the Russian model of uh, this uh, new trend. Uh, ladies and gentlemen who are listening to us and watching, uh, dictatorial authoritarian, authoritarianism is real because, and, and sometimes very difficult to circumvent because it comes under the guise of the need to actually regulate uh, digital spaces, online civic spaces. And they are presented as very important as regulatory circles that uh, must define uh, what is right and what is wrong. And most of the time, they take on or they have a backing from, uh, from the public. And we witnessed this both by use of the law and also uh, by, by use uh, of fiscal policies, fiscal policies as mechanisms. This election was also very interesting, using fiscal policies or products or tools as mechanisms of, of uh, disabling uh, online assembly and, and discourse. And, and that continues in the taxation going on uh, surrounding data, uh, among other things. The seventh one is what is dear to us as, uh, again, as we saw in this election, is the, 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 the emerging reconstruction of a new citizen. There's a new citizen, Lyombo tried to bring that citizen out. When, when he talked of the fear, he said he was shocked with the fear people had to speak about things that are normal. Okay. When you reconstruct a citizen, it is deliberate. Because when you reconstruct a citizen, you inherently are reconstructing consent from that citizen. So you have situations where I got a privilege of this of having uh, discussions and, and, and interviews with people who had lost, I thought, um, um, or people who had their loved ones 
in a forced disappearance. The scrutiny you could go through before they could talk to you. you know? And the fear, the secondary victims of a forced disappearance, because we, we always talk about the primary victim, someone has disappeared, but we discovered that actually there was more trauma in the secondary victim and actually that the primary victim was not the key to the state, but the impact of the enforced disappearance on the secondary victim. Because remember the secondary victim had his vote or her vote. And the shock, the fear, the trauma, the, the look back at who has sent you, are you part of the state? You know, you, 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 you're doing a particular act on a loved one, but indirectly, you're actually reconstructing the remnants, uh, the remnant citizen. Uh, I'm, I'm not talking about uh, the other remnants where I also belong. And, and, and comrades, this is real. So we have a, a, a citizen uh, that has retreated. And when the, the citizen retreats, they demand uh, all chapter four guarantees are seen as privileges, not rights. And that is a digression in our democratization agenda. And, and we can always have a chat more uh, on this uh, citizen who is besieged and overwhelmed. Okay? And it becomes difficult to turn this citizen later into a human that can feel the self worth again and entitled uh, to those uh, demands in chapter four um, provisions. Now, as we conclude, in HP, we pose three questions to our human rights uh, uh, fraternity where we belong to there. That it is critical for us to revisit the discourse on human rights protection and promotion in Uganda and the place of chapter four guarantees, particularly in four, four, um, spaces, or if I should, or dynamics. It, 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 should the movement continue acting as it is? Or it should also transform. Transform why? Because of these four things, three. One, all of what we saw must be contextualized into a militarizing Uganda. How do we continue the agenda of human rights in what is before us, the militarizing Uganda? By yesterday, many of you know that permanent secretaries are increasingly also cropping into, or we are also picking them from the military. Permanent secretaries, supposedly supposed to be technical fellows. So how do we deal with this aspect? How do we uh, enforce all of, or push on for all of these rights in this situation? Number two, you will agree with me, or you will agree with us that uh, we have entered the decisive stage of what is now clearly a dominant one party political dispensation. I know you're going to tell me, or you will tell us, as an actual, but there is no, there is this and this. Uh, in our understanding, and as we are traversing this work, that the way we push on for human rights protection and promotion in dominant party states must be revisited. Because you practically have a country, and rightly so, which is running a dominant political party that is almost in every setting. And then lastly, again, put for thought for us to discuss as the movement that how do we uh, continue to protect and promote human rights in a non transitioning liberation movement, which sometimes disguises as a party. And for us to understand this, we need to be very, very critical and probably uh, look deeper in two countries that have also had, or where we are, which were governed at one time by liberation movement which fortunately for them, they changed and became progressive political parties. The likes of uh, South Africa, ANC, Mozambique, their fellow Mozea, among others. Because comrades, the way you run or you push for chapter four guarantees 
in a country where people believe you owe them because they fall. You owe them because you are liberated. It's a different uh, terrain uh, when it comes to this discourse. And these issues came up again in the election. The statements of, of where were you returned? The statements of, but you people, why don't you appreciate return? And, and they were not subtle statements. There were statements telling you that, hey, remember. But we, we also, again, if I should die, but we also saw recently another traditional leader coming up and saying the same thing, that, hey, not only you, are also there. This discourse is key for our country to have guided by the question, what more do we owe you? What more? <laughs> if, if, uh, if it's not you who owes us to make sure that what you actually brought uh, is sustained. These were our findings. As Netfield, as a group, as an organization, as a team of over 140 followers who believe in social justice and who believe uh, that elections, the right to vote is the highest level of political participation and everything must be done to ensure that space that allows the exercise of this right comes to pass. Our small contribution to this discourse are these findings. But even more importantly, our bigger contribution to this discourse nationally are these questions that we leave to you, that we must have candidly without threats of do you know who I am, you know, threats of uh, where, where are you, and then we discuss and bequeath uh, uh, a next generation uh, something. Please, I want to thank you for giving me Oh, uh, well, thank you so much, James. James, go with that microphone to that seat. Um, what he has done is to simply provoke us to find that report, read it, interact with it, and do something about it. Um, as James takes his seat just before I hand over to Charles, uh, Dr. Robina Namusisi, Resident Country Director, International Republican Institute in the Gambia. I'm glad to see you on the platform. Thank you for being a part of this. It is a pleasure. There is a comment that came in from Simon Senyonga in the chat room. And he says, special thanks to the team of students and Netfield. Attention should also be given to the special interest group elections which represent majority of the population in the context of the general elections. Conversations need to be heard around the holding of delegates by the state, hiding of voters registers, outright refusal of holding the delegates conference, among other atrocities against the freedom of expression, assembly, and association. And then um, we have another comment coming in from, uh, was it Daniel? Yes, Daniel, Emmanuel, sorry. Emmanuel says, this is a, a very great work and powerful report, great work for training students in the context of COVID-19 learning challenges. Kudos to the students, to Netfield and to the School of Law. Great. I want to hand over to Charles. Uh, Charles will tell us what is happening, who is where. Charles, we are all here. Thank you very much. Uh, you've done an excellent job. Uh, you talked about people on TV, and I think you've done an excellent job since we started in the morning. So kudos to you, and uh, may you join me to give him uh, a round of applause. Thank you very much, Arthur. And thank you very much to the students who presented the two reports earlier. And thank you very much to James for this very intriguing um, report. You made my work much easier because you asked, you said the questions for me. I need to find answers uh, for them from uh, you and the others that are part, part of this discussion. My name is Charles Mwangusha Mpagi. I am um, mainly a journalist. 
I've been growing old and trying to find other things to do. So a uh, declaration of interest, I did uh, participate in this election we're discussing. I wasn't successful. I'm trying to find my feet in other things and uh, redefining myself going forward. Yes, I've also made an attempt to become a lawyer. I haven't succeeded yet. I hope I will succeed someday. I have on the panel, uh, James, uh, happy to have you back on the panel. I have uh, Agatha Atere. Agatha is a lawyer and is a journalist. And she's been very active um, uh, in public spaces, debating some of these issues. I want to believe that I have uh, uh, that I have Yusuf online, do I? Uh, do I have Yusuf online? Yusuf Serunkuma, who's an academic. I think I should have him online. Yusuf, if I have you online, please uh, get on. Uh, let's start this discussion. He's on, great. Uh, so I have Yusuf Serunkuma, who's an academic best at this institution. He writes a lot in the Observer, and you must have seen him. Um, you, 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 you must have interacted with some of his writings, uh, I believe. Very nice to have you. I want to start with a very broad question. And I want to throw this back to James, even before I go to the other panelists. James, you, you're studying this election. The students did study this election. Your focus was on uh, the 2021 general elections in Uganda, human rights violations, and the specter of violence. The issues you point out to me seem to raise questions about not just our commitment to chapter four of our constitution, but to the broader democratization process, which this election is supposed to represent. Where does that stand, uh, your, your findings? Do you feel like democracy is taking root? Or we're just holding election for the sake of holding election. Thank you. I, I, I got a privilege at one time uh, to land on uh, an interview recording, a reading of the same. And uh, the late Kano Mayombo had been asked the question on what they had introduced as people who went to the war. And he said that we did not, the person that was interviewing him seemed to be saying that he introduced democracy, but he, he shut it down and said we did not introduce that, we introduced a democratization process, which it is possible we may not be able to see. Now, we, 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 we went into the field with this thinking that if it, this is a process, are we moving backwards uh, or forward? Because there's a tendency for people to believe that they are the ultimate end uh, of something that they have introduced. But we're interested in finding out whether we have had inroads that are positive that are being you know, built onto, onto this. Now, uh, 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 Charles, that's why we diverted from should we report violations or what the violations mean? And we had to adopt what the violations mean because we're sensing the digression. So when you ask whether we are seeing a progression uh, towards uh, democratization, I can't start, to, I mean, we can't as not to run away from the fact that we are on a journey, but we received a very heavy hiccup, a hiccup of losing 54 people. It's a judicial an election. It's a big hiccup. And the bigger hiccup actually is normalizing it, that death or those deaths. So for, for us, we believe Netfield, that even a single life lost when exercising a right, of course, uh, we can debate the circumstances of loss. We can't debate the loss. But we, we believe uh, uh, that from our findings that uh, these are, uh, are, are steps that are taking us backwards. Because, for example, Charles, if they were, they were not there, we wouldn't be here debating this. But every time these things happen, it takes us backwards. So in the context of um, stability of institutions, we think we are not yet there. By stability of institutions, I mean the institutions that guarantee actually the process of democratization strength, being strengthened. Thank you. Um, Agatha, let me come to you quickly. Uh, this report finds very interesting, uh, uh, makes very interesting findings. In other democracies, 
whether you're looking at the example of the United States, for example, or neighboring Kenya, ethnic blocks are harnessed for trade off. What this report seems to find is that an ethnic block emerges questioning, being anxious, gets criminalized. Um, I, I don't know in your interpretation, both from uh, your journalistic and legal background, what this means for this country going forward. Um, thank you, Charles. Thank you, Jim, for that. Um, when I was reading it, I uh, think that was so, yeah? Like, but what is there about numbers and data about numbers? Um, becomes a bit becomes a bit of a challenge because we want to talk about the actual numbers to see the severity of the problem. Why it is true that even one, like which is um, unnecessarily important, but we, if if the hand uh, is a big one, you you get to understand that the problem is actually and it's like God from your So I'm uh, going to. Uh, about um, uh, it's being looking at ninety percent of the people that is getting from that one ethnic group, and um, I think it's uh, it's becoming a problem. When uh, new and people are came up, I had um, inside of the country, country so the police. And they say, how are you supporting these people or even defending the fight? And I said, uh, but I find you guys emotionalistic that you're actually calling this. Because I was asking, why are you calling people power tribes? And they said, look at its membership. I asked, did any person, any of you go to join no and you were told? And there was no one. Now, that... When that happened with the other accusing, uh, accusing one side of being tribalistic, uh, I think being on census. Uh, when Jim uh, talks, a hustle, you went through to talk to these victims or victims' loved ones. It reminded me of a uh, time I called a new supporter in Nakasongola. I, I think during the elections, I was working with the and we wanted to five years coming to this election. So we need from the other region where I'm seven had, I mean, where I'm seven had less support. We wanted a support of the seven years to talk about their reasons for that. So I call this man. And of course, these are. I need you to speak closer to the microphone, yes, I think. Yes, mm. These are uh, semi literates that don't speak English. So I struggle with Uganda. And, and he could tell I don't know Uganda. He said, And, <laughs> and I said, that I'm a Mnyankole, but I'm not. That he refused to talk to me. Because after I explained, I asked more questions. That uncomfortable. So you have these two ethnic groups. So the mistrust is from both sides. I said the other side that I first talked about, the mistrust is a little better. This side, however, it's a reaction to what, what has been happening. It's a reaction to thinking that we have been, it's a reaction to thinking that they are out to get, which which is what the findings show. So we don't know if this was targeting this ethnic group or it was um, because, you know, the ethnic group that we are in the middle of this city where the ethnic group comes from. But I, I think the way that, that, that the, the state handled it is it's rather peculiar. Because like, um, I think Professor you would that wants to to catch on and, and get them back to, to their side. But you now see a government that 
has become more repressive and, uh, and sort of doesn't care about the consequences. And, and I think, of course, that that potent danger. I, I need to pick it up from uh, the question I asked James at the beginning, that you're in your sixth election under a new constitution. It's a positive. And you're measuring steps going forward, either progress, stagnation, or what you call the reversal. If you arrive at your sixth election and the demonstration is what you just described to us, that the country is actually not getting closer to each other, it's, uh, the, the, the gulf is widening. What does that mean uh, going forward? Because uh, James writes something, and the study writes something very intriguing. Talks about interrogating the findings, looking beyond the statistics, the numbers. And I think what I like about the study is that it identifies two victims, the primary victim and the secondary victim who is many, many victims because the entire family is, is, is locked in there. Now, if you're questioning uh, and the, 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 the spectacle of violence for a country that has emerged from so much violence and trying to walk away from it, where does this place the country going forward? Yeah, Agatha, that's safe for you. I, I don't know. I think it's hard to now predict uh, what will happen. Um, until the 2021 elections, I think the election that had, that had gone on in history as the most violent one was the 2001 election. But when you look at this, the 2021 election, what happened in 2001 is not even half of what happened this time. Now, we have been talking about this, but for someone who has watched this government, from the time it, I think there's a time they would blow hot and cold of, uh, you know, uh, be impressive today, but try to, to, to feed them. And that's why some people call it a hybrid um, democracy, something. But now we are increasingly seeing um, someone that doesn't care about the consequences of what is happening. After the 54 days. Mm. And I don't like to say 54 because we don't know. <laughs> there's no research that that will help us find out now. I've learned from journalistic experience from uh, the previous election in uh, the 2011 election. The violence that was unleashed on the 12th of May at the swearing in that the numbers that we interact with are significantly suppressed. Because I think in that election, in that violence on the swearing in day, which was the day Kiza Besti returned, officially recorded were 29 deaths. But as a journalist in the field and uh, death certificates that I saw, the numbers were much, much higher. So even the 54, um, um, yes, yes, the yes, significant yes. Inter uh, interrogation. So after that, in those incidents, so November 18th and 19th, we first interact with the Minister of Security then, who says that the police has a right to kill you. And then President Museven comes after and, and, and says, um, you don't joke with the uh, NRA. <laughs> yeah. So you would, you'd, it, for me, it was shocking, very shocking, that uh, you would expect that someone is saying, no, this shouldn't have happened even if he doesn't mean it, like the speech he gave the other day about human rights after those comments, and then you come and say, you have, don't kill people, don't beat people, or don't torture people, something like that. So you'd expect him to say something that even if we don't believe it, but, but he's trying to hide um, and pretend that he cares, but he came and said, you don't joke with the, the NRA revolutionaries. So for me, that shows that, um, and, and this, we've said this before, that as in journalism, why you you would be critical of President Museven without a lot of fear 10 years ago, it's not the same now. And, and I think that's what happens, that a dictatorship keeps thinking, getting more and more insecure, 
and, and, and tends to be more dictatorial than it was previously. Now, for me, the trend that I am talking about shows that where we're headed could be what okay. uh, will be what. Let me get uh, Yusuf Serunkum on this. Uh, Yusuf, I'll ask a question that James actually said for me. Is it criminal for a region to show political discontent? Uh, for a region to show political discontent? Uh, Charles, I'm happy to be here. Thank you so much. For It looks like the, the setup for the fourth estate back in the days. Uh, <clears throat> thank you so much for... I would thank Netville for trying to sort of revive the, the setup for the fourth estate. It looks really beautiful. Uh, I'm sorry, everybody, I'm going to bore you with, I think, breakages in network and stuff like that. But a region to show this content, um, I, I hope you're not asking the question because you're defining the region as an ethnic category, right? I, I would rather think you're describing this region as a cosmopolitan category, as the capital of the country, as the capital where uh, political and commercial and cultural activity that defines the rest of the country happens, right? And as I've often argued, Kampala remains sort of the head of the country in the sense that once Kampala is lost, the entire country is lost. And because it is Kampala, the people in this city interact with the mess of Museveni's government every single day. Okay, they are closer to the dysfunction than anybody else. Uh, and also they are closer to conscientization than anybody else in the country, right? Uh, it's, it's in Kampala that we read newspapers, okay? Even if you don't read them, at least you watch the headlines on the stands and you see how much money is stolen on a single day. Uh, it is in Kampala that we at least watch uh, television in the evening and we see the mess in the country, okay? And because of that, I would rather define the region as, as just being the capital of commercial and political activity as opposed to being an ethnic category, right? And as you know, Kampala, Kampala is not really uh, a, a, a Buganda cosmopolitan, but well, as Buganda is often described and spoken about, Buganda is a, cos a cosmopolitan identity in the sense that everybody is welcome as long as you learn to speak Luganda and perhaps pay allegiance to the king. Okay, so the people who live in this region, uh, disagreed, expressed discontent, not because they are Uganda, but because of their closer interaction to the mess that Museveni's government is. Okay. Is that you done? Yeah, yeah. I, I will, that's, that's the response to the question that you put to me. Thank you. Thank you. But you my, 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 I need to follow up with that question, uh, Yusuf. What does that mean? It's uh, universally accepted that urban areas Kampala, for example, contributes almost 70% of our tax revenues, uh, GDP. Kampala is where you describe all these activities are happening and you're interacting with them on a daily basis, which is actually the broader central, not just Kampala. You're looking at Kampala, including Mokono, Wakiso, Mpiji, and the neighboring areas. All of these are involved. And naturally, you expect that this content grows in urban centers more than it does in rural areas. But if you define the violence that we saw in the 2021 20, elections as largely concentrated around this area with pickings in other places, I would want uh, you to go beyond that and uh, look at previous expressions of this content that spread to areas like Masaka, that spread to areas Mokon and beyond, and then do the pickings of the other urbanized areas. What does that mean for the country's democratization process. What does it mean uh, in, in that broader context? Thank you. Uh, there are two parts of that question, Charles. And, uh, I, I, and I think part of the response is contained in the question. The more urbanized communities are, the more politically aware they are. And that often translates into demand for better service delivery, demand for a, a better political space in which they can thrive. Okay, it, it simply follows, right? It simply follows that the more urbanized, the more exposed, the more educated, the more conscientized. And as you said, they contribute more. And this is not just Kampala, by the way. And as you said, it's, it's the region, the central region, basically. It includes Masaka, it includes Wakiso, it includes Mukono. So this region 
uh, is so is sort of the center of the of the country. So their interaction with uh, um, Savannah's bad governance is concentrated in this area, but they don't only interact with the bad governance, they also get the opportunity to be exposed to alternative discourses of how a country can be run better. So they will, they will, they will, they will often and often, every time they have a chance to do it, they often protest. Uh, but what does it mean to a democratization process? And, and I, I'm going to say, as opposed to you guys there, this is what democracy offers, right? Because if you are under an autocratic government, a clear autocracy, there will be no elections, right? So we'll have no violence under elections because there'll be no elections. This is what democracy offers, especially when presidents have power. When presidents have power, when a man in charge of running the country has power as the president has, politics will become do or die. It will become a do or die affair that for you to have an semblance of success in whatever you're going to do is you have to be close to the man in, in the office. And, and so perhaps the first question to ask, when did the elections become a do or die affair? It is when a lot of power a lot of success, a lot of opportunities got concentrated into the hands of the man on top. Okay, you, you saw what happened when the families of Kutesa and Museveni went head to head in Maokota. All right, it, it meant, you know, it, it, political office translates into wealth. It translates into opportunity. So that's what happened to this country. When you look elsewhere, democracies are often messy, right? But people can carry with their other lives, not minding who is actually in the office who is in the office of the president. So the levels of violence are less. The levels of abuse are less. What we have in Uganda, and I can tell you because, you know, we, we have been following the trends, say, since we went into a, a, a multi-party dispensation. So the trends are not going to change because Museveni still has access to your food, food and water, access to your bread and butter. Museveni controls this very, very tightly. So as long as he does that, I, I can guarantee you, even the next election, 2026, 20, the violence is going to be even escalated as long as Museveni is still in office and as long as still has power in okay. his hands. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I need to run through a few other issues uh, emerging out of this report uh, that we need to interrogate. And uh, Arthur, if you could help check if there are any questions coming from uh, uh, other members participating in this uh, webinar and uh, report launch online. Uh, please share them with me so that I can uh, read them out to all of us. Uh, let me come back to you, um, James. You, you pose a critical question, which you call military justice. Is it justice at all, actually? <laughs> that's, a, that's a very interesting question. Uh, we, 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 we chose to call it such because in its legal sense, it's supposed to be... Um, uh, military just before the high track, in a way. Um, we must contextualize this that uh, uh, as we, we talk of a militarizing state, uh, a state that militarizes retreats to the military, um, but begins. Okay? It is even more so when that state is headed by Comagoridas in the actual factual sense because of the trust of comradeship that, I mean, exists. And because of the belief that these people know the historical mission, <laughs> you know, they, they, they have that uh, narrative of historical mission. So it is very easy to construct an opponent into a threat of the historical mission, which is known by the military as defined and known by them. So actually the deployment of military justice to do with civilians, that's why we argue, is not a mistake, but it is deliberate because these civilians have been Christianized and, uh, and transformed into enemies of the mission that the military must take on. So they are not seen um, as civilians in that context. They are seen as enemies of that mission. Now, the problem is that that mission counts as chapter four. <laughs> because sometimes that mission is not known only but a few uh, 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 comrades, you know, who, who were there. And so to them, 
it is military justice because it must be dispensed to anyone who is a saboteur, a charlatan, an obscurantist, as the president calls them. Um, but to us here, because we, we think that we should be governed by the rule of law, which is well down, well laid down in the constitution, uh, it takes on a different connotation of justice to actually uh, misuse of that justice. That's why we maintain the argument that um, whereas it is okay to deploy military justice where it is supposed to be deployed, it is not okay for you to hijack it and uh, create facts that fit its entry into what is uh, uh, otherwise a civilian altercation that must be dealt with uh, with the civilian uh, judiciary system. And secondly, uh, Charles, is that when you begin taking away things or issues that are supposed to be solved by particular entities and then you take them to other entities that you think you're controlling, you're inherently killing, disabling, and passing a vote of no confidence uh, in these other mainstream uh, institutions. So even in this so-called military justice that we saw in enforced disappearances, there's also a very implicit contestation between the civilian justice system and the military justice system. But because you have the civilian uh, justice system and the judiciary you know, told to be quiet and stay away, you don't see it coming out. But we are beginning to see it in judgments. Some people, uh, you were talking about the judgment of uh, the most recent constitutional judgment, uh, you know, the, the, the um, the, the constitutional court was championing human rights. No, the, the constitutional court was actually fighting militarization. It is actually becoming a tool of demilitarizing. It is saying, demilitarize this thing. It doesn't belong to you. It is civilian. Really, it's supposed to be us handling these matters. So we, we are beginning to see, a, a, you know, lawyers can choose to see it as a legal humanistic debate, but you clearly see uh, some people, uh, some judges are saying no, you must stay where you belong. We should also deal with our own people. And for that matter, um, uh, some sections of the UPDF Act are null and void because they counter uh, uh, the constitution. For, for, so first we choose to see it in that contextualization uh, of, of the need to balance between the two, using and following what is uh, legal. And of course, striking down those opportunistic sections. Because again, legally speaking, legally speaking, the, the military court marshals are right when you look at the law, but we also know that uh, some laws in some situations are unjust and must be shot down with what Kanye Hamba said, the available legal measures, uh, uh, such that they don't accentuate uh, violations. So this is one of such uh, cases, but which will remain positive because of the ongoing litigation around them. Yeah, Agatha, I want to pick up on that militarization uh, thing, because I, I see. I don't know if the report talks about it. Uh, from what I have read so far, I haven't seen to see it. There is a graduation, just like James is saying, uh, from uh, who executed the mission on 18th and 19th. Was it civil civil police? Was it military? Was it who? If the people who come out of that, who survive that, but end up being picked up, end up in a military court trial and military detention. And uh, you, 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 you're talking about systematic, he called it systematic deployment. It's another deployment. You're deployed in the military court, you're deployed on the streets of Kampala to sort out some mess and, uh, and defend the historical, the historical mission as he talks, he talks about it. What are the retreat options? And for young people, students engaging in these questions, engaging these uh, realities today, what would you tell them? What does a young law student who is interested in better governance is engaging in this, um, in studies like this, uh, the excellent presentation by uh, Luyombo and his colleagues earlier, or the, 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 the other report done by Julian and uh, her colleagues? to this particular report we're debating at the moment, what options exist for them to try and redirect the course of governance and democracy? Options. 
you're asking about the options of Ugandan. Yes, Ugandans, young Ugandans who are interested in these things. Um, when, when we did uh, no, in our first year, um, Professor Lokonyango told us constitutional law two. Yeah, yes. Um, the, what he said as he left the class when we finished the course was, um, was that even if we forget everything else, it was important to remember that the constitution is supreme. Later on, I found I have a political scientist friend of mine who said that um, the problem he has with lawyers, especially human rights activists, is they are naive and idealistic. And, and I think he was actually talking about Professor Lokal Nyang and, and the group that, <laughs> that pays attention to the laws that we have. Uh, Abasi, when he was presenting his findings here, he talked about the generalization of uh, section eight of the public order management act. Mm. And I was seated laughing and but but before I could finish my, my thought he, he he talked about what came next. So we celebrated I think one week or two days the the, the nullification of um, of the of that section of the act. But after that what we saw in this election was worse than when the act was actually there. And for me, that means that as lawyers, we cite the law, we cite the cases, but are they, are, do they really matter in this country? And it reminded me of an article that I opened again here. I don't know how many times I have referred this article by um, Dr. Sinja Kabumba, talking about the illegal, the 1995 constitution. And uh, the one part that I, I like a lot is uh, where he says, that when you talk about violation of the constitution, it's not that the constitution has been violated. The constitution is itself naked, important, and illegal. The real source of power in this country is the gun, is the military. And we are talking about the military and taking uh, civilians to military courts. So, so the options then, it's good to know that these laws exist, beautiful laws and but it's, it's also good to keep it at the back of our mind that these laws don't work in this country. And, and, and us who actually think they work and, and uh, refer to them most of the time, we are called naive and idealistic. I have been called that so many times. Recently, I don't know if people here know that I've been having a fight with LDC. And, and my fight is citing that these are your rules. You gave them to us. Why didn't you follow them? Everyone is thinking that's not a big deal because <laughs> there's no following the law or the rules in this country. Like, why are you asking for the obvious? That, that's, that's what the sense you get. Some lawyers even told me, you know, for us, we never saw our marks. Like the senior lawyers, we never saw our results. So what's the big deal? And, and, that's, and that's a big problem. That in this country, what James talked about, that we have seen this right as privileges is very true because, because we are reduced to that. We have that the structure here that, that has engulfed us. So our, our, our options as young lawyers, as uh, citizens of this country, I think are to just continue standing for what's right, whether you are naive or branded naive or idealistic. I, I think Ugandans need to learn to stand up for themselves. And, and I thought that um, the reason people don't stand up for themselves when I was growing up in rural areas was that they didn't know what they, what they deserve. They didn't know their rights. They didn't know what they are worth. But when you find that even us that went to school started the law, or even those, even if you haven't started the law, but at least you know no one should just come and kill you, yeah? Or kidnap your person. But we keep quiet. And uh, in keeping quiet, which actually stems out of the fear that these people, they, they thrive on that fear. I keep thinking that if it wasn't just Chisa SJ in uh, 2001 and up, up to 2016, if it wasn't just uh, um, Robert Chaplin, 
everywhere there's a leader like that and encouraging people to rise up. And if all of us really made our voices to be heard, I keep thinking that you know you'll get that critical mass that at the end of the day we need to as our option. But the apart from that, we can cite the laws, we can, but we have very little power. Thank you. Yes. Um, I have a message here from uh, Dr. Najita Msoke, who says, thank you, School of Law, NetPill, and the researchers who participated in this project. This is a conversation we needed to have yesterday. As School of Law, we should also be thinking of where we go from here. I believe it is incumbent upon us to provide leadership, guidance, and focus towards efforts for the protection and promotion of rights discussed here, as well as all other human rights. That's from uh, Dr. Najita Okay, Thank you very much, uh, Doctor, for sharing that uh, with us. Yusuf, let me come back to you one more time, and then we should be uh, wrapping this up. I, I am going to skip uh, the issue on, um, on, on digital authoritarianism, the Chinese and Russian model. Um, uh, we, we're familiar with that. But, but jump to the question of um, constructing a new citizen. I, I find that very, very interesting. I think you referred to it from your experience trying to interview people. Um, he referred to it as the experiences the research has met, but we know we live uh, with this. Um, Yusuf, when the citizenry is reconstructed and reshaped to fear, to respect authority, uh, don't touch things that don't concern you, huh? Uh, hey, that kind of citizen. Uh, <laughs> instead of uh, uh, the citizen who is asked to query it out, to one of what does that mean for the country, especially a young country like Uganda? I, I'm glad you asked uh, me that question, uh, Charles, because I wanted to pick on the comment that um, Agatha made about nobody respects these laws in this country. But I, I found that a wonderful comment. But then as Agatha was winding up, she said, we should continue standing up for what is right. Okay, and, and, and I think that's, that's, that's kind of cryptic when you say we should continue standing up for what is right. How should we do it? I think that becomes a very interesting question mm -hmm. because it ties into what you just said. over. You know, I think that's a very interesting juxtaposition. What should happen in this case? So if you are standing up for what is right, how should you stand up, right? And I think this question brings introspection onto uh, people who are involved in this human rights work. You know, you we have documented, reported human rights abuses in this country for the last maybe 25 or 30 years, right? From the birth of the NGO industry. We have been doing this documentation. But you, 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 would, you would be surprised to learn that if you plot the graph, despite our work in report, reporting and perhaps trying to put up cases in court, the curve has been rising, right? The curve of violence against the human, against people in the country has been on the rising you know, Ben, we are simply going up in our abuses of human rights. So you ask the question, you know, us who claim to be activists and scholars and analysts and human rights workers, does our work really matter in this context? What are we doing? How, how are we standing up for what is right? Okay, and, and I think when you flip it, you realize that perhaps our work doesn't matter at all. Okay, because despite our meticulous work in documenting and reporting and exposing the abusers and the abusers, it seems, our work, does, it seems our work doesn't matter. Okay, and what that means, it means we need to step up, perhaps to step out from the way of doing things and embark on a different mode of operandi. And Agatha there mentioned some very wonderful names, Kiza Besige and, uh, and Robert Chagulani. The ways they've done it, is not through simply documentation. They've taken the battle where it's supposed to be taken. And, and I think this is gonna be my appeal to you know, us and everybody else who's interested in making sure this country is governed better. I think it's maybe high time we stopped simply documenting, right? Uh, uh, James there said they were even working 
um, clandestinely, right? Because they were afraid to show their faces that they're actually following up on human rights. They have to work under covers. I think that's dangerous. I interacted with the, the, the fact-finding mission when this report first came out. And you, can, you could not imagine the nervousness in the room, the fear of these human rights workers were into when they were trying to discuss their fact-finding report. It was, and I said, these, these are like people that we look up to as well. So we, those who are in the trenches, the NU people, NUP uh, activists, they look up to the human rights defenders, but the fear, the tension, they were speaking in low tones. James, you remember that? You're speaking in, you, I mean, you're speaking in whispers. Okay, and, and I think it's high time, you know, we stop speaking in whispers as, as when you think of imagining a new citizenry, it should begin with us when this work. Perhaps <laughs> when, when you stop speaking mm. whispers, you stop at reporting and documenting and giving these wonderful presentations to actually doing the work. Let's follow Kiza Besig and Robert Jagling's example. I think maybe there lies mm -hmm. our salvation as a new citizenry. Thank you very much. Uh, let me ask, do I have any comment from the members here with me here? Uh, do I have any other comment from? Okay, thank you very much, uh, Agatha. Thank you very much, James. James, I need you to wrap up uh, on this report. What next? From you and Netbill, what next? Well, we we <laughs> we, we 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 live in uncertain times, and uh, our next actions uh, must remain ambiguous. <laughs> but uh, this certainly <laughs> won't be a go avalanche in some of these. No, James, I disagree. <laughs> Legal avalanche uh, 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 speaks like uh, the tsunami that was promised many years ago. So we, we, we're still waiting. Uh, Agatha, just one uh, last comment from you. And, and then Yusuf, prepare yours as well. Um, I think my last comment is from what Yusuf is saying. I think what Yusuf was saying was that I sounded like I am contradicting myself when I say that uh, no one respects the laws, and then I say, stand up for ourselves. Uh, uh, and, and he asks, how do we stand up? I, I remember um, last year, I, I was um, interviewing Honorable uh, uh, Miriam, and uh, we were talking about what is going on and how we can um, stand up, like use of the and uh, and Madam said the, the problem is you are not accustomed to settling for less, mm. and and it's exactly what I was talking about here. So the, the standing up is that uh, whatever means that can it might not be effective in terms of I have stood up and and I have been heard, yeah, or I have said something and I've been heard and what I've said has been acted upon. But I actually believe that for us, that is our role. That's where, that's the only thing we can do, right? So let us do it and ask the questions and, and, and stand up and, um, I mean, <clears throat> demand that our rights are respected. And it doesn't have to be my rights if, because like they say, an injustice anywhere, injustice everywhere. If we got up when James's rights are, are violated, if we did not be the Tebin Quarter for time, which we are. I, I think, and, and that's why I talked of, of, of uh, Robert Chakulani and this, and I'm not saying they're the only ones that have fought. I, I want to, to be on record saying that so many other people mm. have played a part in their own way. Uh, in 2016, uh, Honorable Manyamshek wrote an open letter and said, we don't have to fight the same way you do. That people who walked out on uh, President Museven's government in protest of the removal of the time limits, and that's the way of fighting. There are people who are writing, there are people who are documenting these things, and there are people who are going on the streets. What I think is that if there was that mobilization, that everywhere you have someone doing something mm. to stand up mm. and to, to do what they uh, is within their means to do, we would have. I think they would think we cannot continue uh, uh, violating, we cannot get away with it any longer. We can't Thank continue you. to get away with it. And that's what I meant, Yusuf. And uh, yes, I call upon all Ugandans to think that if uh, uh, Julian's rights are violated, I should, I should speak up. Thank you. 
Um, uh, I would have to need, uh, Arthur will need another whole discussion about this. I have very strong views about that and uh, the aggregation of those different efforts. Yusuf, your last word, you have uh, 30 seconds. Uh, there is an interview that uh, the Observer journalist, Habato Luka, did with uh, Muzei Bianyima in 2007. And Habato Luka asks Muzei Bianyima, how do we stand up to the mess in this country? How, how do we change the fortunes of this country? And in response, Mzevi Anima looked at Habato Luka in the face and said, you man, you're young. You're so young to be asking me that question. You go and fight Mzevi, go to the bush. That was the response that Mzevi Anima gave to Habato Luka. But you know, since there are no bushes anymore, the bushes have been redefined. The bushes now are the streets of Kampala, right? If, if we were to change the fortunes of this country as human rights defenders, we have to protest and protest enormously. You know, I'm so proud. I, I know, like you may call me a cynic, Charles, uh, and, and James there. You know, when I see uh, Mr. Mseveni closing NGOs and civil society organizations now, it's inwardly, I'm like, I think that's a good trend for this country because you know what happens? You force a guy such as James Nkubi to leave his swanky office in Makere and take to the streets and fight him. You get a guy, a guy as smart and highly credentialed such no as- No uh, to the street, you find you on the street, doesn't he? Yeah, street you, street. you, you, you yes. need to get me onto the street. You need to get uh, uh, um, Opio on the street, Nicholas Opio on the street. Once chapter four is closed, once Netflix is closed, uh, God Batum Shabe should be on the street protesting in as opposed to giving lectures. And, and he should be doing the, the real work of taking on the, the, the space, fighting for the space in which he has to exercise his, his, his agency. You see, so I, you know, in, inwardly, sort of cynically, I like the trend that Museveni is doing closing NGOs because what happens in return is that he forces yeah. these people to actually challenge him directly. And I think there lies you and I the fortunes have... of this country. You and I will have that discussion deeper. Um, um, I, I, like I said earlier, I, I, I tried my bit, but we'll have to exchange. Uh, thank you very much to my panel. Can you join me to give them a round of applause? Thank you very much to our online audience. And allow me to hand back the microphone to the excellent Arthur to lead us to the conclusion. Apologies for the extra 11 minutes. Thank, thank you. you so much, Charles. Friends, let's give Charles a hand clap. I you don't know what burden he lifted off my shoulder and my chest. Charles, thank you for provoking that thought process. And Charles did ask a question, what next? I think it's only fair and proper that we hear on uh, something about the recommendations that are coming out of this report. And the authors are saying to parliament, can we use the Human Rights Committee of Parliament, institute a comprehensive inquiry into the events surrounding the 18th and the 19th. Still to Parliament, the Committee on Internal Affairs and Defense, can you investigate specifically the role of the military police and the unidentified security agencies in the activities between November and May 2021? 20, the Uganda Human Rights Commission, I know at the time of writing this report, the commission was not fully constituted. Uh, right now that it is fully constituted. As custodians of chapter four of the constitution, can you undertake in-depth investigations into the human rights violations that happened during the electoral period? To Uganda police force, Uganda people's defense forces and other security agencies, you have two recommendations. Can you investigate all cases of enforced disappearances that have been documented throughout the entire period of the, of the elections mm -hmm. as having been executed by those or your institutions? And then the second recommendation, immediately release all those that are still being held arbitrarily, those that have been denied, uh, communication with family and lawyers, all can you endeavor to see a process that allows for expeditious disposal of their cases. To civil society, continue monitoring. 
document the ongoing military trials, the pre-trial detentions, the enforced disappearances that are connected to the elections. Civil society, you have another recommendation. Could you consider the possibility of seeking accountability for victims through strategic private prosecutions targeting the identified government agents within the security agencies? And then the other recommendation coming into civil society, using the findings established in clause one above, engage the regional, continental, and international human rights state reporting mechanisms on uh, the state of human rights in Uganda. There are two recommendations for electoral commission, very interesting recommendations. In future elections, can the commissioners of the EC spread out to the different regions of the country during the campaigns? So as to superintend over the activities of the campaigns as opposed to remaining at the center and wait for complaints to be filed at the center. The other recommendation going to the electoral commission, EC should revisit the decision not to have civil society organizations accredited as election observers, as this supports the accountability function in the course of the campaigns and the elections. The absence of accredited CSOs to observe the 20, 2021 elections left a free playing field for violation of human rights and freedoms. Those are the recommendations in the report. I have one recommendation for us as Ugandans. We all have a stake in this country. Yes, I know we are done with the elections, but there is another election soon. Those that are advising us to stop the politicking, the election talk and get to work. I have a word for you. Can we continue with these conversations such that by the time we get to 2026, we have better processes, we have better laws, we have a better practice for our elections. We should not be silenced. And that's what we mean when we talk of freedom of expression. That's my recommendation to all of us. Ladies and gentlemen, the last bit of this, allow me to invite the principal school of law together with the chairperson, the advisory committee and uh, representatives of uh, the authors or the researchers for this work for us to have these works launched. The principal, chairperson, represent the authors of this work. Uh, thank you so much, Arthur. Congratulations for uh, getting this far. I know it has not been easy. Congratulations to the authors, a combination of uh, my students, former students, colleagues, and senior colleagues like James Muhindo here. I'm so excited to launch this report or these reports, but more to that, I'm so excited that uh, the law school that I envisioned a few years ago when I took over the leadership of the school is here. The law school of yesteryears, when I was a student in the 90s, is so different from the law school of today. And the law school of today is what a law school should be. A law school should be provocative, a law school should inculcate a spirit of civic responsibility. A law school should provide civic space. A law school should push for law reform. A law school should go beyond what lawyers traditionally do. When I was trained as a lawyer in 1996 to 1999 and went to LDC, I was trained to be a commercial legal practitioner. And uh, the people I admired then, were people that were very successful in commercial legal practice. 
And my dream was to have a big law firm, have uh, portability clients, uh, CEOs of uh, banks and, uh, and the like. But along the way, I discovered that actually practicing commercial law in an environment where the rule of law is uh, on a downward trend, where civic, right, civil and political rights are violated, where social justice is not a, an issue and social injustice rules the day is useless. So we embarked on a process of promoting civic awareness and uh, transforming the law school into a school that is committed to promoting both civic empowerment as well as social justice. So it's, uh, I'm excited that I'm actually standing here with my students, including current students, and actually launching reports that are informing national and international dialogues on issues that are pertinent to us. Once again, congratulations to the students. And uh, surely, I don't expect any of my students that took part in this to get retakes, because uh, the high level of intellectual engagement the students have exhibited. Actually, when I was supervising one of the groups, I was blown away by the level of uh, uh, intellectual exposition that the students uh, put into, in, into this. So I have no doubt that these reports are going to go a long way. Uh, we no longer produce legal literature to be kept in the libraries. That's the law school of yesterday. The law school of today is active. We are going to pursue these reports. I will officially ask a sign of a letter signed by the principal forwarding these reports to the relevant authorities. That's what a principle of law in a school, uh, in a prestigious university like Makerele, which is celebrating 100 years, uh, should do. So thank you so much. Uh, I don't know the formalities of uh, launching reports. I'm told the formalities are that I say that by virtue of the authority interested to me as a social justice lawyer, as a public interest lawyer, crowned as the principal of law, I formally launch the report. Thank you so much for God and my country as we build for the future. Thank you so much, Professor Christopher Ambazera, the principal school of law for that official launch. And congratulations, School of Law, congratulations. The network of public interest lawyers, congratulations to the persons behind these reports and congratulations to each one of us that has taken part. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for joining us. See you next year as we launch the next reports. God bless you.